It's good to be in the Lord's presence, isn't it? And we're going to uh, go ahead and take our offering now, so let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the table that has been spread for us. Thank you that there's a day coming that uh, every wrong would be made right. All of the struggle that we currently experience will be relieved. And Lord, I, I just thank you that um, we have that great day to look forward to. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed. And now, thank you that we get to be part of your mission. Thank you that we can, we can give our lives. That's really what you want first. And then, uh, of course, the resources you've given us. Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering and that you would allow it to resource the mission here and to resource the outreach into the world as well as uh, our community. And so, Lord, thank you uh, for this opportunity to give. And would you bless this time and bless each person who, is, is, who, who gives. And would you just come and, and, and be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, God bless you as you give this morning. And I'm going to go ahead and start the message here where we're going to talk about a new series called Timeless. And if you've been here, you know that we've been in a whole series called Life on Mission. And we've been looking at the mission of Jesus Christ and how each of us are, get to be part of that. And, but one, one thing, it's, it's, reason it's important to, to kind of back away from that and to look at the things that are timeless is because uh, there's so many things that are fads, right? Right? A lot of things that just come and go. Uh, there are business trends. There are fashion trends. There are hairstyle trends. I, I don't know what those are, but there are, are hairstyle trends. There are economic trends. There are music trends, and the list can go on and on. Technology is also a thing that's trendy. I've got something here that I found in my junk drawer. Know what this is? It's an old iPod. Right, it's one of the first. I remember when this, this was one of the first ones that came out, and uh, you know that you can put 50 songs on this thing? I mean, it is amazing. I mean, when this thing came out, it was just incredible how, how current and cutting edge this was. I mean, you could put it in your computer and download songs from this place called iTunes. It was just incredible. And now, of course, it's just come and it's gone. And, and so it's important that we understand that we live in a trendy world, that things come and go, fads come and go, but there are some things that are timeless, and we need to learn to live by the principles and kind of wear the things, you know, uh, get, get these practices in our lives that go beyond just the current fad and onto what is really eternal. And so bottom line this morning, if you're taking notes uh, in, your, in your program today, here's the first fill in the blank. In a trendy world, the best things in life are timeless. They are. In other words, there's a way to live our lives that's never going to go out of style. Uh, this looks good on whoever wears them, and we need to invest our lives in the things that are timeless. Now, it's okay to keep up with the trends. I mean, I, I think it's important and it's good to, you know, be fashionable and, you know, keep, keep up. And there are times when we need to change things. I mean, we change the, you know, the colors in the church and different things about, you know, how we present ourselves to the community. That stuff's going to change, but there are principles principles that never, ever change. And so in this series, we're going to look at how to live our lives in a way that's going to impact both now and forever. And, and, we're, and, and these, these principles, these values, are going to gain value over time, unlike this thing. I don't think I could get much money now. I paid a lot of money for it, but I get very little bit for this right now, right? Uh, unless there's an antique dealer. I got, come on up and see me later, okay? Well, the first thing, part one we're going to look at today is this, eternity. What is heaven like. We're going to start with eternity. Now, eternity is certainly timeless, right? Um, but here's the question. What is heaven like? A Gallup poll showed that 81%, 81% of American people believe in heaven. 81%. I mean, isn't that incredible? Uh, I mean, you can't get 81% uh, of Americans to agree on anything, right? And, and yet, they all agree that there's a heaven. However, Everybody doesn't have the same understanding about what heaven looks like or what heaven's going to be like or how to get to heaven. And, and so that gap leaves us wondering, how can heaven and eternity have any impact on today? Today. And in fact, what, the, what we're going to talk about today, my prayer is that it will not just impact someday forever when we think about heaven, but we're going to, we're going to actually, it's going to impact the way we live in the next seven days of our lives. It's going to have an impact on Tuesday. It's going to have an impact on how you are living your life, this very idea. 
So in many ways, heaven is marginalized. You know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die, <laughs> right? And, and, and so we, we kind of push heaven out of our mind. We kind of keep it distant. We marginalize ourselves from it. And when heaven is trivialized, here's the point, our lives can become marginalized. You know, we, we, think if we, we think of heaven uh, less, then maybe it'll make this life more important, when in reality, the opposite is true. When we think about heaven more, then it makes this world, this, this, our moments here on earth, even more valuable when we realize what's real. Let me give you some examples about how heaven gets trivialized. When you think of heaven, what do you think of? Well, we, we see a lot of times pictures of heaven as being clouds, white fluffy clouds with you know, people kind of walking around in that mist you know, that's kind of there. And, and there's robes and there's you know, angel wings and, and there's lots and lots of songs, right? right? And we're going to sing songs for, forever. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to sing songs. We're singing forever and ever and ever. And you know, when I think about heaven that way, you know, you know what it, what it makes me nervous. I mean, it, 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 and you know what it what kind of reminds me? I'm afraid I'm going to get bored. Right? Anybody else? Know what I'm saying? If that's our view of heaven, and see, heaven's a much better place than hell. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I mean, I don't want to go to hell, so I'd rather go to heaven. But, but then maybe, just maybe, if that's what heaven is, then, then the things here on earth, the things that we get to enjoy, you know, and, and the people and the experiences, maybe this is better. Maybe I want to put that off as long as I can because this is better. See? And, you know, Hollywood doesn't help any either, right? I mean, what we have Morgan Freeman mopping, you know, floors, uh, thinking about, you know, heaven. Or we have, uh, there's this, this uh, show on called The Good Place. I don't know if you've seen it. I've watched a couple of the episodes, and it's like, that is not heaven. Okay, I mean, that's just not what the Bible talks, Kristen Bell and, and uh, Ted Danson. But, you know, if it's true that, um, you know, that, that you're a believer, and even if you're not a believer, you know, th this idea of heaven and hell, you know, there's a myth. There's this myth about hell. I heard it, heard it the other day. It's like, um, hell is, it, it's going to be better for me to go to hell, somebody would think, say, because all my friends are going to be there, right? And it's like, that's just crazy. I mean, that's just crazy talk. You don't, you don't want to go to hell, and, and, and if you do go to hell and your friends are there, you're not going to know your friends anyway. It's going to be a very isolated, terrible place. But all this is to say that we as Christians, even as believers, we have doubts about how fun heaven's going to be, you know, how good heaven's going to be. Now, please, um, if, you, if you're kind of pushing against that, let me give you proof that, that you believe that. How many of you have said, well, I, I want to go to heaven, but let me get married first, right? I want to go to heaven, but I want to go, you know, on that vacation, or I want to do that thing, or, or, or live that part of life and enjoy some things about this life. See, we all, we all not sure if heaven's going to be even better. And when we say this, we buy into this myth as well. Heaven's important, and I want to go there, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the next seven days. And, and how is that going to help me when I face this Tuesday? And so today we're going to look at this powerful truth, and it's a truth that I, I, I really, I'm, I hope I'm not overselling it, but I think it's going to really change our lives. I think if we'll, if we'll grasp this, it can really change our lives, and it can mean something for your business uh, what you're doing in work this week and how you're, you know, working out uh, with, with school and, and, and what's going on in your marriage, your family, um, your relationships, just life in general. And we have this wrong image of, of, of heaven. We, we kind of we hang on to dear life, to this life, instead of, instead of living our lives in a way that, wow, there, there is eternity, there is heaven. And so um, we're not convinced, you know, that heaven's better. But the opposite is just true. And, and we're going to see that in Scripture today. When we look at the Bible, the Scripture teaches us a great vision about heaven, and, and it's just going to be so fantastic. When we grasp this, I think we're going to have a better grasp even on uh, a greater vision for this life and the moments that we have before that. Two disclaimers this morning. First disclaimer is this, I have never visited heaven, okay? So I, I don't know what heaven looks like. Okay, have you, anybody ever visited heaven? So, so you know, if, you, if you're making travel plans, you travel with, you know, with an agent, and, and they've never been there, you may go, I'm not sure if I want to listen to that person, because they're just telling me what they've heard. And so, but what I can tell you is that the scripture is clear. The, the Bible gives us these images and these, this teaching about heaven. So, you know, we, we trust what God has to say about heaven. He's been there, <laughs> okay? He, he's, he's faithful, 
And so we're going to kind of weave this into the fabric of what we talk about here. So second, when we use the word heaven this morning, when I use it, uh, we're going to talk about heaven before Christ returns. So heaven, you know, like, like when we die, we go to heaven, but uh, there are lots of debates about, you know, when, when Christ returns and how all that's going to happen, and we're not going to get into those debates this morning. That's for another time, maybe another uh, uh, discussion. But when we use today the word eternity in heaven, what I want to refer to is an eternity in heaven is the time after Jesus returns and after, after he's established his kingdom, and we're going to be with Jesus forever and ever, okay? And so that's eternity in heaven, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about. That's the vision that we're going to look at here today. So I want to look at a couple misconceptions we get started. Number one, misconception one, this is in your notes if you want to take a note. Believers in Jesus will spend eternity in heaven. I'm calling that a misconception. You go, what? Well, technically, it's true, okay? We're going to spend eternity in heaven. And technically, it's not true, okay? And it sounds very confusing, very controversial. I'm going to clear it up, I hope, here in just a little bit. We're going to start with the scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Now, the context of Isaiah, this, what's, what's going on here, is that uh, Isaiah the prophet, he's uh, been given the word of God, and he's speaking to the nation of Judah. He's writing from Jerusalem, and uh, he has uh, 39 chapters, I mean, all filled with judgment, about the judgment that's coming on the people of God because of their disobedience. And then I love it because then after that, God churns that thing around, and he now proclaims blessing and comfort, gives words of comfort in chapters 40 through 66 about the future and about what's going to happen in the future. And this is what Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. This is truth. Here's what Isaiah 65, 17 reveals. He says, see, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. A new earth. A what? A new earth. So there's a concept of a new earth. And God repeats this in the very next chapter in Isaiah 66, 22. As the new heavens and the new earth that I will make endure before me, so will your name and descendants endure. And so he's talking about not just a new heaven, but there's also a new earth. It's going to be a new earth. And, and, and so this phrase, new heaven and new earth, it's really monumental. It's really important for us to grasp if we're going to think about eternity in heaven. It is to understand this new heaven and what the new earth means. Now, um, this phrase, it's inclusive of earth. Okay, there's a new earth that we're going to be part of in heaven. And uh, this goes on into the New Testament. And let's, let's uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And, and here's, what, here's what it says there. It says, in keeping with his promise, Peter, again, says through the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness is dwells. So it's going to be a, a perfect place. Righteousness is going to dwell there. Instead of unrighteousness that we see on the news all the time, this is going to be a place of righteousness. Now, what does this mean? Uh, in his book about heaven, Randy Alcorn, he makes this great point about believers in Jesus will spend eternity on the new earth. He says, while technically it's true that believers will spend eternity in heaven, it's more accurate to say believers in Jesus will spend eternity on the new earth. Why? Why is this such a big deal? Well, it's huge because if our thinking about heaven is floaty clouds and kind of, you know, like, like, like uh, you know, endless uh, places, like a dreamlike, uh, trance-like place and floating around, then, then we have this, this crazy, like, really not real view of heaven. What the Bible teaches us is an accurate view. And in fact, it's more accurate to go out and, and to look at a sunrise, or to look at the stars and to understand and see the creation of God. And if you, if you have ever wondered at that, if you've ever gone, whoa, God is great. I, I, I had an opportunity a few weeks ago to uh, go down the Smoky Mountains. We hiked a little bit. And, and at 1230 in the morning, I set my alarm because I heard there's going to be a meteor shower. So I set my alarm, and I woke everybody up. I didn't care. I got up, and I went out there, and I laid down, and I just saw these stars and the grandeur of God, and you know, no, no lights you know, around, just, just the stars. And it was like, wow, God is awesome. And if you've experienced that wonder, you're experiencing 
what heaven is like. See, and you know more about eternity, and you know more about what eternity is going to be like than you may even realize when we get a glimpse. We get this glimpse. And you know one of the most exciting things about this new heaven and new earth is that God is going to live there with us. That's going to be fantastic. And if God is there, that's heaven, man. And see, we're kind of talking semantics here, okay? I mean, you get what I'm saying, right? I mean, but, but there is a earth. I mean, we have a physical resurrection. We, we talk about that. And there's going to be a place for us to live. And God's going to provide everything we need. It's going to be so awesome. And if that's not enough, let me point out a, a new word uh, and, and what it means in the original language, it, the, what, what the word new means, okay? New, new, the word N-E-W. Neos is one Greek word. You know, you know that the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And so, uh, again, neos is one word that Peter, by the inspiration of the Spirit, could have chosen. It means brand new. Kainos is another word for new. And it means to restore something to its original intent. Okay? So it's like when you restore an old car. You know, you make it, you make it restored, you make it as good or better than new, right? And so it's restored to its original intent. And so guess which word Peter uses here? Is it the first or the second one? It's the second one. In other words, he's not going to make it brand new. He is restoring something to its original intent. See, God's going to make it all new. Who knows? Maybe there's going to be a Grove City, Ohio. Maybe there's going to be a Columbus, Ohio, but there's not going to be any traffic. <laughs> Isn't that going to be great? But can, can you imagine? And, and I know that's a silly example, but it's a far more biblical thought than to think of floaty clouds. It just is. And, and a harp. Somebody's strumming a harp. It, it, there's, there's a place that we're going to live. And why is this important? Because this concept that heaven is going to be boring is inaccurate. And again, can you imagine a fully redeemed earth? Can you, remember, can, you, can you just imagine a perfect place, a perfect earth? No war, no disease, no struggles. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when God restores everything and he makes it all brand new? I mean, you can eat donuts and there's no calories. Hallelujah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I have no idea. But you know, you have a better understanding of what heaven's going to be like than you realize. You do. When God created, remember when God created everything at the beginning, Adam and Eve? Remember that story about Adam and Eve? And God had them in this garden, and he made everything, you know. And what did, what did God say when he created? He said, it's good. He said, it's good. He said, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good, right? And do you think that Adam and Eve ever had this sense of, oh, I can't wait until I die and go to heaven. No. Why? Because they were in heaven. They were in paradise. They were in this perfect place. And, and, and what happened? They sinned. They messed it up. And all of us, we're all messed up by sin. But there's a day coming. Here's the gospel. You ready for the good news? You see, we live in a broken, fallen, messed up world. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came and he is the son of God, and he gave his life for our sins, and then he resurrected from the dead, and he's the firstborn from among the dead, and we are going to raise as well. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so, and so, Jesus came to redeem God's creation back to its original intent. He's going to make everything kainos. He's going to make everything new. Now, when you hear that, we started our discussion by saying, now this is going to make a difference in the way you live your next seven days. And, and, and here's where we're going to go to misconception number two. What you do, here's a misconception, what you do on this earth determines whether you go to heaven, but once you're there, it's the same for everybody. All right? Now this is a misconception. Ironically, the, teacher, the scripture teaches exactly the opposite. Okay? Here's what the scripture teaches. It is only by grace through faith that you are saved. It is not by what you do. Okay? So if you're here, you're trying to work hard enough to be saved, if you're trying to do enough good things to tip the scale so that you can you know, get on God's good side, then stop. Stop trying so hard and receive the grace of God. 
And that's the good news today. That's the gospel that Jesus took away all that sin and shame. Come to the table. Come to the table of the redeemed. Come and just receive this good news. Okay? But, uh, so, so, however, the Bible doesn't stop there, and it makes this very interesting point. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. And, 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 and I want to set up the context of this because it's really important. If you look at the context of this chapter, this verse, the context is that this is written to believers. This is written to people like us who believe here this morning. All you that believe, this is written to you. Okay? And so here's what he says. Uh, this is this Paul's writing. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things we have done while in the body, whether good or bad. So in other words, we are all going to come before the judgment seat. Now, the judgment seat, uh, that Greek word is bima, bima seat. How many heard, heard bima seat, right? And so that's where we get the word bima seat. It's right from the scripture. And, and in fact, I put a picture up here of Corinth. This is uh, the bima seat in Corinth. This is from some archaeology. And, uh, and the bima seat was actually where they would, when, when the uh, contestants um, <clears throat> in, a, in, in the Olympics or in, in the, the contest when they would get their, their prize, they would stand before the Bema seat and they would get their award. And it was also the place where there would be judgment. Uh, in fact, Paul uh, appeared before probably this very place in Acts chapter 18, verse 13, where it says Paul's enemies dragged him to court and charged him with persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And so he had to stand judgment. And so we're all going to be, there's going to be a day when we'll stand before the Bema seat. Okay, and so this is written with believers in mind. And so in other words, God is taking notes on your life and my life. He's taking notes. And there's going to be a day when we stand before him. We're going to be responsible for what we've done, either good or bad. And, and, and to make sure that, that we get this point, Paul talks about it. Jesus talks more about it. Look at Romans 14.10. Uh, this is Paul's writing. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. So in other words, stop judging your brother or sister, okay? Stop it, because there's a day when they're going to stand, they're going to be responsible to God for what they're doing. So you don't worry about it, let God worry about it. Jesus, here's what he says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Ooh. Okay, so just be careful with your words, right? Because we, we, we have to stand before God. This can be a little unsettling, disturbing, disconcerting. The reason it's unsettling is it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Because it matters how you and I live our life. It matters. It matters to God. And so I just want to make it clear, and, and there's this myth that, that how I live my life doesn't impact my eternal life. And that's just not true. That's not what Scripture teaches. Everyone gets into heaven the same way as through faith in Jesus Christ, but we will be rewarded or not rewarded for what we've done in this life. That's what the Scripture teaches. And I know that this is like a, I don't think this gets taught a lot. And, 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 and in light of this truth, everything, every day matters. It matters. It matters how we live our life. It matters what you do on Tuesday this week. It matters, you know, whether or not you're living for Jesus this week. It just matters. And, and as your pastor, I need to make sure that you know that, 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 that the Scripture teaches that. That, the, that your business deal, that you do that with integrity, that uh, as you, you know, are, are at school, that you're doing that with, with integrity and taking a stand for Christ as you're spending time with your family, as you're you know, just living your life. And so here's the challenge that I want to make today, okay? And it's just this, 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 this challenge. Make one decision this week that reflects not the myths about heaven, but which reflects the truth about eternity with God. At least one, one decision that, that, it, it, that it matters what you do with your life. This could be something your marriage, it could be something your work, something you do for another person. Do one thing that's going to stand the test of time. You know, our, our life groups have been serving, and, uh, you know, it, it, it matters that we serve. I, I know uh, this last week we had some people take, their, their, uh, take a day off of work to come and to uh, serve, you know, and, and do some uh, just serve some food to some teachers in our community. I thought, that's fantastic. I mean, that, it, it matters. That, that's not going to be in the regret column. Anything you do for Jesus, that's not going to be in your regret column someday. I'm telling you. It's just not. And so continue to serve the Lord. Be, be obedient. A cup of cold water given in his name. It's, this is not a competition, okay? This is just being obedient, just doing the things that God's calling you to do and to be faithful with it. 
We, we took a, a spiritual gifts assessment. A lot of you who went through the, uh, the, the life groups, you, do, you did a spiritual gifts assessment. You looked at, see, how, how is it that I'm uniquely gifted? And now, now it's time to use those gifts. And if you're not plugged in, if you're not you know, being used here at the church, or if you want to start a new ministry or whatever, come, talk to any of us pastors or the elders of the church. We'd be happy to sit down with you, pray with you about what it is and how it is that God can use you to take your next step. Well, before we close, I just want to give a couple of illustrations. First one is this. You see this dot up here and a line, okay? And, and the dot, and you may, have, you may have heard this before, but it's such a good one. And, and the dot represents your life before you die. Now, what does Scripture say? That's 70, maybe 80 years. And you're going, oh, I'm almost 70. Well, guess what? You know, Scripture teaches, number your days are right. It may gain a heart of wisdom. I mean, none of us are going to live forever, okay? And so, and so we only have this little bit of time, right? This little dot, and, and sometimes we spend so much time thinking about that dot. And, you know, and, and I think it's great to think about retirement, great to think, you know, and, uh, to, to do all the things we get tied up in. you got to live life. We've got to be wise. We've got to do all of those things. That's really important. Leave a legacy. All of that's good. But what kind of legacy are you leaving and I leaving for eternity? Right? Are we not only investing in the dot, or are we investing in the line? And that line goes on and on and on, right? I mean, that line's going to go through Indiana and then on out to Colorado, and then I don't know how far it's going to be. It's just going to keep going and going and going through eternity. I mean, here's your life, and then, whew, got all that life yet to live. And, and, and God is saying what you do now, that there is going to be a reward in heaven. And so be careful with how you live. So are you living for the line? Are you living for the dot? It doesn't make more sense to invest in what's eternal, what's timeless, than just this moment. I love what Jesus says. He says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, don't you want to hear those words? I do. And so you've been faithful of a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. You're not going to spend eternity just twiddling your thumbs. You're going to have lots to do. And he's going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Be faithful. Be faithful now, and, and God's going to make you ha have, have even more happiness. See, I, I love that happiness. It's, it's not about, you know, this idea that we're working and we're trying to, you know, get a bigger mansion in heaven. What's that about? That's crazy. You know, it's not that. It's, that's a materialistic way to look at it. No, we see, share your master's happiness. What makes your master, our master Jesus, happy? It's the people that we love. It's, in, it's the people that you invest your life in. I, I love how Paul writes it in Philippians 4. He says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Why do you race? You race to get a crown, right? And he says, the people, you, my brothers and sisters, you, you, Paul say, you are my joy and my crown. And so stand firm in the Lord in this way, my friends. Stand firm. I want to finish with this illustration um, uh, Melissa Spolster, she came and she, she spoke at our, our women's conference, and uh, I, I was one of the few guys here. <laughs> and so, uh, so they were having this conversation about something about women. I don't know what it was, but I, but I was like kind of listening in. And so I peeked in the back there, I was walking through the doors, and everybody looked at me, and they laughed. And I'm like, uh-oh, I came in at the wrong time. You know what I mean? And, and so uh, I had to get out of there really fast. But, uh, but it was a, she, she, she was great, had some great teaching. And what she said, this last illustration, remind me of Scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4. It says, while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us a spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You see, you and I, we live in this tent, and, and you know, your tent might be getting, you know, kind of ruffled, and beaten up, and ripped, and all of that stuff, but, we, but there's a day coming when you're going to get a new thing. There's going to be, you're not going to be unclothed. You're going to be clothed with the heavenly dwelling, okay? We're going to, the mortal will be swallowed up by life, and this is why God has fashioned us, why he's made us now, so that we will get this, and, and, and so this is coming, okay? Eternity with heaven, in, in heaven with God is real, and, and we've been given this deposit that's guaranteeing this. You know what that deposit is? The Holy Spirit of God. He's, going, he's always with us. 
And you know, I can't always be with you. I can't be there to encourage you and say nice things. And, you know, and, and if you expect me, you know, always be the one that's, you know, encouraging you, I'm going to fail you miserably. Okay? I'm only just one little person here on earth. But you know who will never fail you? The Holy Spirit. He's always with you. He's a, called the paraclete. He's the one who walks beside. That's what it literally, that, that word literally means, a paraclete, the one who walks beside you always. So he's always with you, and he is the pot deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And so <clears throat> what she said was, we need to drink our H2O every day. And she had a little bottle of water, and I'm like, I'm going to take a drink right now. Oh. And she said, heaven <clears throat> plus the Holy Spirit equals optimism. Isn't that a great teaching? Because, see, we, we, we walk around sometimes, we bow our heads down, and we get discouraged, and we get focused on the dot, and we, 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 just, we just get so worried about what's going on right here. And what we need to do is we need to have that bigger vision, right, of heaven and what's coming, the new heaven, the new earth, and that God's going to be there, and it's all going to be made new. He's going to repurpose it, and it's going to be perfect. And, and we've been given the Holy Spirit. So if you've got heaven waiting for you, and you've got the Holy Spirit's presence right now, what is not, why aren't you more optimistic, right? We all can be optimistic because we know what our inheritance is in Jesus. And so this is the invitation today, is to, is to come to the table, it's to come and receive this grace, come and know Jesus. Let's live our lives in a timeless way, not that's filled up with the things of this earth, but that it, it, it is filled up with the passion to be on the mission of Jesus Christ. I invite you to stand with me. And what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to close our time here by focusing on um, this song. But it's, it's, a, it's a song that's a song about, about Jesus. And this song is about the fact that Jesus is worthy. He is the worthy lamb who was slain. You know, God created the heavens and the earth. And as he created, he said it is good. But then he said it's not good that we're alone. And so he made us for relationship. That same relationship that God has enjoyed for eternity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so he made man and he made woman. And he made us for a relationship. And that relationship was broken by sin. And we'd experience death and separation. But there's a day coming when the world will be made new. The heavens and the earth that we know now will disappear. But there will be a new heaven. And there will be a new earth. And Jesus Christ will be Lord of all. And we will reign with him forever and ever and ever. And it's going to be perfect. There's not going to be any more sorrow or pain or guilt or shame. And it's all because Jesus Christ has purchased us by his blood. He is worthy. And so let's, uh, let's proclaim this this morning because God is alive right now. And there are angels I know around his throne that proclaim, holy, holy, holy. And so let's join that mighty chorus today. Let's get our eyes fixed, not on the things of this earth, but on things that are above.